This week on Three Sides of the Coin, it is uh, me and Mark and Mike. No Ed, no problem. Hey-o. Hey-o. <laughs> uh, I joined a little late, I apologize, but that's okay. Better late than never, right? Um, thank you. So this week we are joined by author extraordinaire and uh, he, was, he was a writer for the San Francisco Chronicle, correct? Chronicle, mm-hmm. yep. See? Um, Joel Selvin, um, who you're going to love this because he's like an amazing storyteller. He has so many cool stories to tell. So uh, it's awesome. And you get the stories see- of Kiss at Winterland Ballroom. And me. First mm-hmm. time I think we've ever talked to somebody who actually saw Kiss at Winterland. That's kick ass. It's very kick ass. And a little Rock and Roll Hall of Fame at the very end. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. Everybody, welcome back to another episode of Three Sides of the Coin. Uh, you got three, you got two Boy, sides you always have. Two sides and a hot side. chick. Yeah, exa- two sides exactly. Two and a hot You know, we've really just come to realize, Ed, uh, the, where is that? Uh, where is Ed today? Actually, Ed hit me up. He's got a lot of fires he's putting out at work today. So, it happens. As we've it always does. said, work comes first. It happens. Um, we're just going to get right into this week's guest. Uh, this is an incredible guest that we're joined by. I, I interviewed this guy a couple weeks ago for my Music Biz Weekly podcast, and I immediately was like, mm, if he's got some kiss stories, he needs to come on. This week, we are joined by an incredible, esteemed, legendary music critic from the San Francisco Chronicle, Joel Selvin. And he's got a brand new book out right now called uh, Hollywood Eden, Electric Guitars, Fast Cars, and the Myth of the California Paradise. He's written dozens of other books as well. But being that he's from San Francisco, he's got some kiss shows that he went to he went to a couple kiss shows at the winterland he saw a kiss at the cow palace the night elvis presley died he shares with us his thoughts of kiss um he shares with us the crowd's reaction to kiss it's it's pretty interesting getting somebody who was there who's the critic and you got to stick to the very end I, at the last minute, ask him a question about the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Good stuff. Good stuff. So let it roll. Joel Selvin. Want to get your official Three Sides of the Coin logo and Shocker tee? Now you can. We ship worldwide. Get yours online at shop.threesidesofthecoin.com. Three Sides of the Coin listeners, I'm really excited, we are really excited to welcome to the show Joel Selvin, um, esteemed music critic for the San Francisco Chronicle for many, many years. And uh, you're here, you've got a new book that you're promoting, which we'll chat about a little bit. You've got a book called uh, electric guitars, fast cars, and the myth of the California paradise, Hollywood Eden. And we'll definitely get into that. But you got some kiss stories we definitely want to hear from you because you've been in, in the San Francisco area since the early 70s, right? Doing Oh, uh, I've worked for the Chronicle since the early 70s. Early 70s I, you know, yeah. I'm yeah. San Francisco area yeah. native, so. So, um, um, you know, as 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 the music critic for the San Francisco Chronicle, I mean, obviously you you had the opportunity or went to many many shows through the decades, and uh, you know, in the Kiss world, their shows at the Winterland Ballroom are some legendary shows for Kiss fans because that was a young, raw, hungry band that really hadn't exploded yet. I mean, they mm-hmm. hadn't, you know, th- this was pre-Kiss Alive, so they hadn't 
reached that were breaking through to the other. I think it was the first, I think it was the first First, album. Yeah. First album. You saw them at the Winterland ballroom. So let's just, let's just dive right in. I mean, what, what were your impressions? Did you, first of all, did you know of Kiss prior to them coming to the Winterland at that point? Well, I was the uh, uh, pop music critic for the Chronicle. Of course I knew about them. Uh, they, they, they had an auspicious debut. They had a shtick. Uh, you know, the, the, they were on the horizon. But I got to qualify myself here because this is 1975 in San Francisco. And, um, you know, I, I want to say that um, there was a bohemian slant to the uh, music scene. Uh, um, I, I don't know how exactly how to dial this in, but this was not KISS territory. Exactly, exactly. I, that was one of the things I was going to ask you is, you know, KISS was from the streets of New York City, raw, dirty, gritty. And California and San Francisco are the exact opposite of what they came from in, in the early 70s. And it's always intrigued me as to what was their reception like? Were they kind of looked at as like, what is this? Are these guys just a shtick, a gimmick? Is this really music? I mean, what do you recall back then? Oh, I, 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 I not only recall things, but I actually refreshed my recollection uh, in preparation today. Homework. Uh, <laughs> and um, it's, it's, it's an interesting story, uh, it, it, given, of course, that, you know, I wasn't geared to understand or get this KISS thing, right? You know, uh, but to me, what you're talking about gritty, I, I'm, it wasn't so much that. It was that it was show business. It was entertainment. The music was secondary. And San Francisco, uh, the, the prevailing aesthetic was that it was all about the music. I mean, Jerry Garcia, he wouldn't put on a special piece of clothing for an audience. Right. Right. You know, you just walk on stage and play the music. So the whole uh, mid 70s, as things began to drift into this show business, uh, uh, Elton John and uh, costumes and makeup and da da da. You know, that was not like uh, something that the San Francisco scene was really geared to to, to embrace. Um, And so Kiss shows up and they are booked into Winterland for what was a series of shows called New Sounds of the City. And they were essentially audition nights for local bands that weren't, you know, <clears throat> getting up on the Fillmore bills like they used to in the 60s, right? And it was a $2 admission, cut rate admission. And they had not done this. Uh, uh, it was always been local talent, but here's this band. There was some money behind them. There was some clout behind them. Uh, there was no ticket sale ability whatsoever. There was no way that these guys were going to sell ticket one. Uh, and so they had to be placed in this specific. I don't know the story behind that, but obviously somebody got to Graham and Graham said, we'll put them on in a new sound of the city show. They sold from, I want to be charitable. There might have been half a house there, but I don't think so. And 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 just real quick, what's the capa- What would the capacity have been? Well, it was fifty four hundred seats. Okay, I, I would I would imagine that there was somewhere around six hundred thousand people that paid the two bucks to see the thing. Not not six 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 not six hundred thousand. No, six hundred to a thousand somewhere. Six hundred to a thousand. Okay, got it. You know that that would be my guess. It, it was it was it was righteously empty. Uh, and and in in my recollection, I had conflated two performances because I was under the impression I had only seen them at Winterland once, but apparently they came back six months later. This is where having clip files come. <laughs> okay, uh, and I reviewed the first one. I I, re- I really could have cared less for them, uh, and and just found the whole sort of entertainment uh, aesthetic. Uh, uh, you know, it was basic rock and roll. A guy lights himself on fire and throws up blood, and there's a, the drums uh, get pushed up in the air. No big thing. But, but and, you, I mean, you say no big thing, but nobody was doing anything to that extreme yeah, at that I just, point no, in time. I, 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 now, here, okay, so here we uh, 
hang on just a second. So it turns out that they come back six months later and play another uh, Winterland show. And I think the deal was with this Winterland thing was, you know, why didn't they come in and play opening act to somebody? I think the deal was always these guys were coming out as a headliner. They insisted on being the headline act. Well, didn't the tubes open up? That's where we're getting to now. Thank you. Uh, so they come back in, in, in June. That's January. They come back in June and play Winterland again. And now the tubes are the opening act. And the tubes... I don't know how to explain the two. Uh, they were the San Francisco band of the moment. Yeah. They, the, the, uh, they came out of the demi uh of like the, the gay underworld, the hip underworld. They weren't hippies, right? right, right. But, you know, the art scene uh, the, uh, and they had attracted like circus performers that like to take quaaludes. Uh, it, it was a it, it was a fantastic San Francisco thing, and they were emergent. They hadn't really they 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 weren't headlining shows yet, but they were they were hustling. They were right there, and opening for Kiss was just up their alley. And they decided they were going to put on a special show. And you know they did all kinds of goofy stuff with props and stuff. You say you know they didn't have I man. Uh, they, they they opened for Mahavishnu Orchestra, which was one of the worst uh, uh, pairings of, of act <laughs> ever. And and there was this thing of uh, that involved Wonder Bread, and they brought out loaves of Wonder Bread and dispensed it to the audience, and the uh, and 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 uh, the the audience made it up in little dough balls and was throwing the Wonder Bread back at the tubes the rest of their time on stage. Uh, they they had a number where uh, the, they wheeled out a serving cart and lifted up a serving plate. And the lead singer's face was sticking out of a platter was surrounded by parsley and somebody held a microphone and he sang his song like he, he was gonna, what are we having for lunch today was the song, okay? But this was all very bohemian. It wasn't the, the, the as you say, gritty or-, or, or uh, It wasn't you know, shock. It wasn't shock. It was funny. It was uh, it, it was uh, uh, theatrical in, in in weird, strange ways. So what they did at Winterland, and this I remember because it was just uh, they um, brought out a new character in a wheelchair, surrounded by nurses, and it was a German doctor, strange kissed. And he talked in this terrible accent and they had some very drony sort of prog rock thing going with it. And, and the nurses were sort of hovering over him. And all of a sudden the prog rock thing changes into it's not unusual. And the Dr. Strangekiss throws off his cloak. He's got a white tuxedo shirt and tight black pants and a little tie around him. The nurses suddenly are in pasties and G-strings. Dun, 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 Tom Jones right there. The place just went nuts. And they followed that with white punks on dope with the guy on 18 inch um, platform yeah. boots and, you know, and, 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 you know, I just thought they laid waste to kiss and, and uh, a, a substantial portion of the audience departed after that. Uh, and what remained, and that was the thing about this that I, I remember was that this was like the youngest male audience I'd seen at Winterland in ages. Hmm. It was like 15 year old kids and they didn't look like San Francisco kids. They looked like bridge and tunnel kids. But the, but the North Beach crowd, had, you know, they'd seen the tubes, they were off. So, I mean, you know, the, d despite my critical evaluation and, and lack of support, Kiss goes on to become one of the, you know, most popular rock bands in the world and they command tremendous uh, uh, fans and they come back to San Francisco completely triumphant in, in August of 77 and they play the Cow Pals. And, and, and this was recently recollected by one of the characters that still works at the paper. And one of his gigs is he likes to go through the photo archive. So he dug up the photos from the Kiss concert and there are way more photos than I remembered, because I mean, it, I just remember them, you know, taking a picture of the band, but they'd shot a lot of the kids and the audience in, in makeup and stuff. And he plastered them all over the web on um, San Francisco Chronicles website. Yep. Uh, I remember it, it seeing Google's them. up really easy. It's a great photo uh, um, thing. 
She was a terrific shooter. Stephanie Mays. Anyway, so I reviewed the show, you know, because that's what you do. You review the new the hot, new hot bands, and you know, and, and and you know, I was unimpressed again, you know. Uh, but the thing that I, that I wanted to mention, uh, Mark, was you know, there's this long review, sort of like, uh, you know, I'm kind of mocking. I'm kind of you know, j just dismissing them. We get down to the last paragraph where I might like mention the opening act. <laughs> it says cheap rock cheap trick a hard rock quartet with a lead guitarist dressed like a cast member of leave it to beaver opened the show <laughs> that's as far as you got i guess that's i did not see it uh uh you know i i, I guess i didn't hear it um <laughs> and 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 if i recall that show was the night Elvis Presley died. Do you remember that? Because they it got I, it. it. It is. They they had yeah. said something on stage that night. Um, you know, remembering Elvis. They dedicated rock and roll night to him that night. Is what they did. To uh, right before they started the encore, they they because that's a very famous kiss that, bootleg. Yeah, there's a bootleg it's of it's that whole Tuesday, show. Up there. It's a Tuesday night. It says here. Um. Yeah, you know, it doesn't make too much reference. You know, I, I, I didn't really get Kiss, I must say. You know, eventually, you know, I came around to understand what the whole thing was. And, and, and you, well, you, well you let, know, let, even... let me ask you, I, yeah. I read a couple questions uh, because <laughs> now, did you like, like Harder Rock? Well, meaning bands like Humble Pie and, and, and Aerosmith and, and Led Zeppelin, and... Deep Purple. Also, I wanted to ask you, because that is where um, Frampton recorded a live, I believe, was in San Francisco, correct? Frampton was, uh, 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 did better in San Francisco than anywhere else in the world. It kind of uh, like he, kissed it. And he, his first three albums were like total stiffs everywhere but San Francisco. I love those records, too. They're, um, they're wonderful. And, and they weren't great. They, you know, like between the three of them, there was a good album's worth. Right. There was like only one or two good cuts on each album, but they were really good. And, and they pounded them on the radio here. So he had a big audience at Winterland, big audience, uh, uh, fervent, like fans of it, you know, when he cut that album. And, and he was, you know, nowhere everywhere else. Uh, but that, I get back to my were you a fan of like Black Sabbath and Led Zeppelin and I mean did you like that kind of stuff it's a checkerboard thing you know you say Led Zeppelin I go yeah you say Black Sabbath eh, not so much uh you, you know humble really pie. Uh, humble pie yeah man humble pie was great you know um, Aerosmith Aerosmith you know what I saw what I remember thinking Aerosmith was like a sort of paint by numbers combination of the Rolling Stones and Led Zeppelin and and they Fair. were at the at, oh, yeah. I, I saw Aerosmith open a Winterland show. Let me get this straight, okay? It was Aerosmith, Bachman Turner Overdrive, and Mott the Hoople. Oh, I would have died. Wow, for that. Mott the Hoople was the headline act. I, you know, Aerosmith I, just I had their first I'm, album out. I'm I'm consider I you know I'm only uh, put it this way. I wasn't old enough to go see Mott. And then they did that final thing. And I think it was 2019. And I was just happy to see. Now, I'd seen Ian Hunter a bunch of times. But, you know, Mott broke up in, what, 74? I mean, with his version, seven, when Ian was in there. And I was so happy that I got to put that in my check column for concerts. Because that was a great band. Um, that was a good show, yeah. Uh, the, and Bachman Turner Overdrive is better than you might imagine. <laughs> oh no, I love them. Are you, are you kidding? Being for, they were gods in Detroit. I they were huge here. Very, that's a very Midwestern band. I mean, uh, uh, yeah, Bachman Turner Overdrive still gets played a lot on the radio out out here. I mean, those those classic hits. It's, it's meat funny. and potatoes. It's, it, yeah. it is, and 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 the guys looked like they could eat the meat and potatoes yes. I mean, it, was, you know, <laughs> it was a for real thing now the other really great winterland bill that i remember from that era is the opening act was steely dan the second act was slade i love slade and humble pie was the Oof. headline wow that's so many many years later i was doing a phone interview with walter becker and i caused to rec recall that i'd seen the winterland show and and did he remember it because you know 
It was a long time ago and they didn't do many shows. And he, there was a silence on the phone. And then he says, you paid your fucking five dollars. Now clap your fucking pants. <laughs> oh, that's funny. So he'd stayed to see Slade. <laughs> well, I mean, that is that's like you know what what one thing doesn't match here. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love Steely Dan, but I mean, I've seen them before. But it, that doesn't. They had mix a lead that. singer that they hired for the gig, right? Uh, uh, Fagan was so stage shy. He put his keyboards facing back and all you saw was this guy's back and shoulders and they hired some sort of jive soul singer, you know. Yeah, reeling in the years. <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 see, it seems like, and tell me what, what you recall about this, but Winterland, Bill Graham, who obviously um, was behind Winterland, had some incredible bills and then bills where you're kind of going ah, i don't know how those bands got put together like i've i've worked for years with greg kin who's local to san francisco and and greg loves to tell the story about how uh bill graham had him open for black sabbath at winterland yeah. and, and and it was just like cannon fodder yeah i mean <laughs> i mean was, was, oh, back then did the bills really need to be thought out or was it just like here let's just put some bands together and it didn't matter I mean, I just, when you're looking at the bills that I'm talking about, you know, those are obviously the, the uh, touring schedules uh, converging, right? I sure. mean, that's just that's just all that is. And he, and he was open every weekend, three bands, six bucks, in, in a, and and whoever showed up that weekend was you know as good as anything. But some, you know, ah, uh, you know, the Grateful Dead played Winterland 120 times or something, uh, and, and, and their the fans were, don't even remember it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there were really, it was an incredible um scene winterland uh and there was a lot of mingling backstage because there wasn't like real dressing rooms in the sense uh there was sort of a common area so you, you know you'd go there and, and 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 you'd see the guys from uh you know say john mayall's blues breakers uh hanging out with uh, uh the uh you know band from los angeles or what it would love or whatever and i remember uh, playing ping pong with uh one of the uh with Christine McVie from when Fleetwood Mac was working their way up the uh, uh, but Bill, you know, Welch was still in the band then. Wow. Um, hey, what uh, how, what do you remember just because of that time? Um, Alice Cooper out there. Um, his, so the his... famous Alice Cooper show was um, uh, 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 at the Fillmore Auditorium when Bill Graham wasn't producing concerts there and, and a San Francisco band called the Flamin' Groovies had taken over uh, putting on the show. Uh, and they had Iggy and the Stooges, Alice Cooper, the MC5, and they opened the show and nobody came. Wow. That would have been the greatest show ever. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's a pretty good lineup, isn't it? But no, nobody came in San Francisco. It's what I call the blue jean mentality of the San Francisco um, music scene. Same with Bowie. Bowie played Winterland and nobody. Nobody. 500 people showed up to see Bowie. I, I will tell you, Bowie, obviously Alice, MC5, and the Stooges were gods and still are here in Detroit. But Bowie was another one that really took off. Much like Kiss. I, just that whole aesthetic, that whole fucking show me something. I and mean, that was really the Detroit rock and roll sort of vibe. And that's why those bands gravitated, you know. to um, Also, too, I mean, just because, again, I'm a Michigan kid. Um, how did Grand Funk do out there? Uh, you know, uh, probably not as well as elsewhere. I don't really remember them. I mean, happening. because they were literally in the early 70s, they were playing Shea Stadium on the East Coast. Yeah, exactly. But no, I don't think they're, you know, registered in the same way in California, uh, even in Southern California. It's, it's I, a distinctly I love getting, sort of Midwestern aesthetic that. at that point. I, I love getting people like you that were there, boots on the ground, because I, I, I still tell that to people. It, it wasn't really terribly long ago where music was a regional. I mean, Bob Seger is a great example of that. Midwest, freaking huge. Couldn't get arrested on the, you know. on. I remember West. Bob's first San Francisco gig. I was one of the 50 people there. Uh, <laughs> it was at a little nightclub called The Orphanage. Uh, and uh, he did, uh, uh, I, I still remember some of the stuff from the set. Uh, he, he was so strong, so strong. Uh, he did like a eight, 10 minute uh, vamp on uh, uh, Van Morrison's song, I've Been Working. Yeah, I love there. It's a great version on the live record of that. He, he did a blues song uh, called You Got to, uh, it was dedicated to Hound Dog Taylor, the Chicago blues singer. 
and and it was called, called you got to see me in the evening if you see me at all and he did bring in the uh, uh um you know so much soul in from mexico i mean there's like the, there were so many th uh, things in that uh nightclub show and the band was awesome and 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 Seeger was charismatic and there were 50 people in the night in the room well, how, how about i'm gonna throw another one how did that was jay giles out there in the early 70s did they even resonate oh no the jay giles band that's a blues band yes did they how'd they do out on early blues band, blues band san francisco love blues bands yeah, I, I tell you what, I, a lot of people don't, unfortunately, there, so many people think they're like centerfold and that, man, <laughs> nope, <laughs> like you said, they are hardcore, that those those early live records, especially Full House, that's full blown hard rock and blues, man, that is that is just the shit, as they say here in, in Detroit, that stuff's fantastic and uh the boy they that, that still is i mean though i used to tell people that was like listening to a bulldozer i mean because when they they came out they were you know they jay, jay giles was just such an incredible band live joel, band one of the best joel, bands ever joel do you you know as a music critic and somebody who saw so many of these bands come through when they weren't big were you were there some that you recognized and go, okay, these guys may not, they may not resonate with San Francisco or California, but man, I could see they've got it and they will get somewhere. It just may not break here in San Francisco. Do you recall any bands like that where you were just like, yeah, I was one of 50 here, but these guys got everything together and San Francisco's missing it. Well, we saw, we saw plenty of that kind of stuff that, that you know, that, that's always a good newspaper story, right? It's like, hey, you know, you ought to check this out. Uh, it, it, you're missing the point here, you know, and, 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 and that, you know, what came to mind as you were talking about it is, is, is being at the office when the movie critic came back from a morning screening with this, this funny look on his face. And he says, I just saw this stupidest goddamn movie that's going to be an everybody's going to uh, uh, pay to see is called home alone. <laughs> and, you know, I thought he's crazy. And, he, you know, he told me what it was about. He told me the, the star's name. I was like, mm -mm, you know, yeah, but yeah, sometimes you see stuff, you just know automatically uh, 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 that it's going to have um, what one smart ass record company executive called uh the sound of beaver pelts slapping on the trading block. <laughs> and there was a lot of that in the 70s. Everybody was, you know, mining for gold. It was no longer a cultural enterprise. It had devolved into a fully commercial operation. And so, like, the hit record was, was the Godhead. And uh, people, you know, spent a lot of money chasing that, that, that sort of, like, magic combination of of uh, hooks and sound and lyric and, and you know and we saw that 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 was a real struggle for the san francisco music scene to adopt to uh all these guys that had, had, had made money being hippies were suddenly you know out of uh, in the cold and 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 had to figure out what to do to you know get audiences out of there and then like by the end of the uh, 70s we had like pablo cruz coming out of a incredibly communal hippie rock band called stone ground that never had a dime a nickel to rub together uh and huey lewis and the news which emerged out of a, a really cool uh marin county band that nobody ever heard of called clover over yeah but he's an incredible harp player though i mean he can that guy played harmonica like nobody's business uh huey lewis well, Huey told me, he said, we're a San Francisco band. We found the five closest musicians and started playing. <laughs> um, Joel, one of the things KISS has always had to contend with through basically their entire career to now is, is the lack of critical acclaim from critics, from reviewers, from the press, you know, and do you think that that is driven by the fact that a lot of them are just like, I don't understand what this is about. I don't get it. I don't know what they were trying to do. Is it more about the show and less about the music? 
you know, it, you know, and and obviously it comes down to you know the the biggest battle was like Kiss versus Rolling Stone and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They never loved us. They never got us. They never understood it. You know, a big middle finger we give them because we succeeded despite them not wanting us to succeed. What do you recall throughout the seventies as somebody who was in that music critic reviewer media scene? Did you have conversations with other people where you guys were just like, I don't get this. Well, it's not a conspiracy. Uh, but look, uh, all art forms develop a critical elite. That's just what it does. The, the, uh, that, that goes back to Paris in the 19th century and, and probably before. So, and, and what, do the, what do the critical elite speak for? What do they represent? Well, they represent some kind of values and aesthetics that are, they think commonly held, but maybe they aren't, maybe they're up for debate. Uh, and what you're talking about is like popular acclaim. Popular acclaim, that doesn't mean anything. That just means people bought it. Uh, it doesn't mean that there's any lasting contribution. It doesn't mean that there's any great aesthetic. It doesn't mean that there's any groundbreaking or pioneering efforts going on. It just means popular acclaim. And Kiss, like a lot of people, and I'm the guy that helped Sammy Hagar write his book. So, you know, I know this whole story. You know, you, look, you want love or money? Which is it? <laughs> okay. You want but money, I, I, you can't have the love. It really is not, you know, you're not going to get the love. You want you want the love, it's a different thing. Ask Bob Dylan. Bob Dylan's never asked anything of his audience, nor has he ever done anything to try and make an extra nickel with his music. So what is it, you know, that, that people love about him? Well, you know, they all have their own reasons. But, you know, nobody loves Iron Butterfly. Well, outside their immediate family. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've always, I've always found that whole sort of critic thinking wrong. Um, I, I, I think if, if people are buying, their, what, what Kiss is doing, Kiss has proved that their music is good because they've sold the amount of records that they've sold. They're still... As to, you're equating tour. popular acclaim with no. quality. Well, and there's no, well, there's no there's no telling that uh, 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 the quality is the fact that people still buy the music. If it wasn't of low quality or no quality, no one would have bought it. But you keep in mind, without the makeup, within the years without the makeup, they still sold 15 million records. Oh, uh, no, I got to agree with you that uh, uh, a lot of the of Kiss's music has proven to be enduring. And the, and 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 that's speaks to your argument. But it, it also, you know, they, they have other, they have other uh, uh, um, points on their uh, evaluation sheet that the critics are going to take points off for. But you're right. Some, uh, some of the records have, have proved to be enduring in ways that like, you know, stuff from Angel and, and, and the other Casablanca heavy metal acts just didn't, right? So, yeah, I, I, look, I, I, I get, and I've said this on the show before, you know, if Robert Plant looked like me, the Zeppelin wouldn't have, I mean, with the same, same sound. No, the golden God helped sell the, the mystique the same way the tongue and the makeup helped sell the mystique. But, you know, going back to somebody like Bruce Springsteen, who's a critic's darling, you know, the, 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 the working man, everything that's a shtick just as much as Alice Cooper's snake is it's freaking show business and everybody's got something to sell. You need a sizzle with the steak. That's all. And there's nothing wrong with, with that. Again, uh, you know, 100 million records or however million records, and that goes for Aerosmith and all the way on down. If you sold a lot of records, you, your music, you know, reverberated. People, people liked it. And Kiss, I, I put Kiss in with, with any band that sold that kind of records. The fact that people say that the, the songs aren't good is bullshit because and I'm not saying, I'm not talking about you. I'm just talking about in general when you hear that. I'm like, well, you know, if it was all just, you know, the trappings, well, their career wouldn't have lasted. There's substance. Oh, you always have to have a hit record. And a hit record is in the groups. I remember they struggled and struggled and struggled to come up with a hit. And they were selling tickets. Well, so did Rush. And, I mean, and, Rush and, and they come up with this thing, Beth. 
right? This ballad, like it was like, that's how they got on the radio. But, you know, go back to Huey Lewis, you know, what he said that the strategy was to infiltrate and double cross. That, you know, to make a hit record that the radio will play and then turn into your real self. And, and, and that, that was a San Francisco sort of subversive approach to the whole thing. Uh, you know, the, the, the Detroit aesthetic is much more, uh, you know, blunderbuss. And, 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 and it doesn't, and nobody really uh, is, is dealing with hip conventions like they do out in California. I mean, that, and, and downtown New York. So this is all a part of it. it that, that, the critical leap draws from those kind of values and draws from those aesthetics. And, and if you wanna be, you know, sell millions of records and, and, and be Aerosmith or Boston or, you know, you know that, that's, that was an available route, but so was Tom Waits. And, and you know, who, who's, whose music, whose character is more deeply imprinted in the lasting part of the culture, Boston or Tom Waits? who never had a million seller. Well, I, I think critics trip over themselves with people like Tom Waits and they don't pay attention to the Tom Schultzes who actually get on the radio. I, that's just my own opinion. Um, I, I always found that kind of stuff. I, again, growing up in Detroit, huge Cream Magazine fan. It, it was, I used to find it funny how they, you know, they, they champion like, uh, uh, what the hell is her name? Patty Smith. You know what I mean? But I'm like, well, hold on, you know, there's so many better acts. They give, you know, her way more space than they'd give like Blois the Colt, but Blois the Colt's on the fucking radio. You know what I mean? Patty Smith isn't. I, I beg your pardon, uh, who? Blois the Colt. Oh, Blue Oyster Colt, Career of Evil. Patty Smith wrote it. Well, that's kind of where I'm getting at. That's kind of <laughs> exactly, exactly right. That's why I chose that. Blue Oyster Colt was, wasn't on the radio then anyway. They weren't on the radio until much later, until the Reaper. Uh, they they, yeah, they, they the were Reaper they, the Reaper seventy six. Yeah, well, Patty Smith's like a seventy four, seventy five. Uh, oh, I uh, I think it's right Cream around. Magazine. Cream Magazine was a critical elite, but they had a very Midwestern sensibility, uh, and 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 they, and they loved a lot of the bands that you're just you're actually talking about, and they poo pooed all the stuff coming out of the West Coast. Oh yes, they did. That was part <laughs> of it. That they did that on purpose because they wanted to be the anti-Rolling Stone. They, they wanted to tell Rolling Stone to stuff it up their ass. We're going to, you know what? We don't want James Taylor. We don't want this mellow shit. We want it loud and blown up. And that's why, like I said, they championed bands like Kiss and Aerosmith and Ted Nugent. That's, that's why. They, you're absolutely right. They, they wanted to shove it up their ass is what they wanted to do. And, and, and they did. I mean, they were very successful. Um, but, you know, I, the, it's funny. To, I even remember as a kid, I, w I remember reading critics things and I'm like, who the fuck is Tom Waits? You know what I mean? It's like, I, I want to hear him. about. I, I, I saw Tom before I'd heard his records. Uh, he was a substitute act for a, a folk singer named John Stewart, who had been in the Kingston Trio or something like that. And, and he, he'd missed his flight from L.A., and so the, the, this guy that was going to be the opening act took over. I want to tell you, you know, you couldn't believe it. This, to be confronted with that person, not having any, be prepared for that kind of uh, uh, level of communication and that kind of wit and imagination. You know, I wanted to know what that guy is doing next. And I have for like 40, 50 years now. That's that's cool. And no, I, I, I'm certainly not putting that down. I'm just saying the the, the writers the critics so-called had their own, you know, certain bits. I'm a big heavy metal fan. And I, I remember buying uh, a motorhead record right when they were just 1980, because the review was terrible from a critic. I knew who hated that kind of music. We know, a, we know a that is a uh, 180, you, you know, yes, a one, it's a 180 critic. Oh man. Judy stone hated that movie. Let's go see it. Bingo. Yeah. No, critics, look, 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 I did this for a living, right? Worked for the newspaper. And, and my job was to go out and write the, uh, see the, the band and write the reviews so that people reading the newspapers could get a report. Now, the first thing was, it had to be a report, right? What I thought of the act was like about third or fourth on the list of the important things to get across. I mean, a story about a baseball game better have the final score in the lead paragraph. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So that was my job. And I went out to, you know, three, four nights a week 
to find stories for the newspaper, to entertain the newspaper readers and keep them up on what was going on in the pop music scene. And I'm not looking for certain kinds of angles. I'm looking for things that interest, that make headlines. I'm looking for things that resonate with readers. And resonate doesn't necessarily mean that they agree with me, okay? It's just that, that there's a, something for them to debate, something for them to think about, some commentary so that they can go, hey, you know what this asshole says over their morning cup of coffee? And, and I did that for like 36 years and I got kind of gifted at sort of like my dialogue with my people out there in the newspaper land because I came to know what they wanted me to do. That doesn't mean I did what they wanted me to do sometimes when they were good. But mostly I, I, I came to understand that I was a conduit of information and that that was my really important uh, 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 task was to be the, the conduit of important information about stuff that we all hold as important, that we have these common interests and we know what they are. And, and yeah, you know, so there's certain frac factions, right? You, you're, you're the heavy metal, hard rock faction. You didn't mention the punk rock faction. I used to hear from those guys all the time. And I was going to ask you, how does, <laughs> were, were you boots on the ground with the thrash movement, which really- Yeah, 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 yeah. Primus, uh, Metallica, uh, I, I really liked Primus, but they're the thinking man's thrash band, right? They're, they're the critics' darlings. They're, they're not Exodus. I saw Exodus. I saw uh, Tempest. And I mean, you know, if you guys are selling out a 3,000-seat theater, you're, you're a candidate for an, a, a review and an inspection. Let's go check this out because, you know, you, you people out in newspaper land, they need to know about you. And, you know, it got kind of weird because I'm getting older than these people. And, you know, I'm, I remember being at a Metallica stadium show where everybody was looking at me like, who's grandpa? And, uh, <laughs> you know, and I, oh, no, it was the Exodus show that I put my ticket on my forehead. <laughs> Fucking awesome. <laughs> so the punk rockers were great. I loved the punk rock thing. I, I you know, music and some of it, not much, but uh, the, but the punk rockers themselves, they were great for newspaper articles. They were funny. They were up to something. They had something to say. Uh, and, well, and on the West Coast, those, those too, scenes and merged in interesting ways, not yeah, just those defensive. Scenes, those scenes merged. I mean, that was the great Eventually, thing about yeah. yeah, the punk and the, and the thrash metal guys. Um, that, 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 that's my, my, uh, kind of later on in the whole thing, you know. Yeah, uh, late eighties. Uh, what, what was the band? I'm trying to think of uh, that was out there with that with that screwy drum set. Mm. The, the, no, the, we, but there was a whole moment where Primus and Psychofunkopus and uh, a, a band you probably never heard called the Smoking Section were packing nightclubs in San Francisco. And this was the beginning of the, they were talking about it being thrash metal. Uh, and, and of course, Primus, I just loved less. And, and, and that band has the best slogan ever in rock history. Primus sucks. Sucks. I saw them. <laughs> And, you know, I saw I, I, that was a weird bill. I saw them. I think it was with Anthrax in Public Enemy, the the rap. That that was know, a when crazy I was up at Lester show. House the first time he played me a tape he'd produced with Charlie Hunter. You know who Charlie Hunter is? I do not. Charlie Hunter is a, a is a nine string jazz guitarist, and I mean hard bop jazz guitarist. There is nothing metal or 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 about Charlie Hunter. And it was, and he's fantastic. He's gone on to become famous in New York jazz circles, but, but his first record was produced by Les Claypool. Hmm, I did not know that. And of course, Les and Waits got together and worked together. I just had a hard time with Promise. It's like, they're, he's tuned down so far, it sounds like his strings are going to fall off his bass. <laughs> he likes that <laughs> resonance. He, he likes to make it thump. <laughs> oh, I, I, you know, it's funny. They're one of those bands I, I get about two, I, and the first two songs are great, and then I'm like, eh, mm -hmm. Some time is in here now. I, I wonder. He, had, I, he felt the same way. I think he, he was. He went through a whole period of of, of, of playing with different uh, uh, people and, under different names uh, all the time. Like Bobby Cox and his Dirty Socks was one of them. I remember that. And and he, there are always these ridiculous names. And you know the the the, the less heads knew it was him, so they he could sell out the Fillmore. And and I think. You know, there'd be a couple of rehearsals and they'd just make it up as they went along. He, he's he's old time San Francisco head without sounding like old time San Francisco. You know what I mean? He's he's a beatnik at heart. 
<laughs> hey, going back to the early, early to mid so this would be 75, 72 to 75. I've always thought, you know, a lot of bands that were touring back then were able to sell tickets or at least get good bookings, but they didn't sell a ton of records. Fog Hat was kind of like that. Um, I think the best case of that is, is a band like Black Oak, Arkansas. They toured like freaking crazy, but they never sold a ton of records. Um, to a degree, Bloister called until, you know, um, un until the, uh, but they were more of an East Coast band. Journey. Joe, oh, girl, oh, bingo, like that, that right in your backyard. That was. Uh, they just kept propping that band up in front of as many bodies as they could, figuring that sooner or later, somebody was going to like it. You, you know, I, I, another great example that, and, and it's, it, it is my favorite debut album of all time. I love Montrose. And when you were talking, you helped. Rock sing. Candy. Oh, that, that yep. record to me is. <laughs> That's Tammy's is finest all. moment in his whole career. Yeah. Well, you know, what's funny that record. And as you know, that record didn't take off at first. Now people appreciate it, but I mean, it, it was a long way from 73 to now. Um, that record out of the gate wasn't a big success, but now over time from Eddie Van Halen on it, it influenced it. Certainly I've been playing drums for over 40 years. And I will tell you that is the record that I wore out the grooves to learning how to play the drums. Denny Carmassi is just the shit. And, and I, and, and the, everything about that first Montrose record to me is per, it's like everything I like right there, that, that record is so perfect. So, and that was, well, I, knew uh, that Sam, was I knew Sammy, uh, from long before that, uh, and he came up to um, San Francisco uh, with a band uh, that, that I had friends in called the Justice Brothers. And, and, and I went to see the Justice Brothers play the same night Ronnie Montrose did. I saw him over there, what the fuck Ronnie Montrose doing here? And Sammy had already been sucking around behind the band's back with, 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 with Ronnie. <laughs> <laughs> I still think had they held that together and stayed in more of a hard. They rock hated movie, each they, other. It would have been hard. I know. Lives. It's, it's, it's <laughs> but man, they were magic together. That, that Ronnie that, Montrose, bless his heart, was a pain in the ass to everybody who knew him, and I think especially to himself. Unfortunately, unfortunately, sure. what a freaking talent, Joel. I, I'd like to kind of get your your perspective on. You know, you talked about how. What, what what the San Francisco culture climate music scene was all about. And and I understand Journey didn't start out as the Journey people know of today. They evolved. Journey but, was a, an industrial project. You know, it was like right from the start, how are we going to make a successful rock band? In fact, they, they crowdsourced before it was called crowdsourcing the name. They had a contest on a radio station to name this band. And although none of the radio station entrants were actually the winner, that was the idea that was that it was a crowdsourced name. Uh, it was put together by uh, the road manager from Santana, Herbie Herbert, with Neil Schoen and Greg Raleigh uh, out of the ashes of Santana. And Santana had been the most phenomenally successful rock band uh, in the history of San Francisco rock. Uh, and they were the kings of, of everything in 1969, selling 100,000 records a week. So these guys that, that had gotten scuttled from the, the, the Santana juggernaut put their heads together. They arranged this band. The Tubes drummer was in it at first. Prairie Prince, Prairie Prince. he wasn't. Ross Valerie, the bass player, was from Herbie's previous band, a San Francisco ballroom band called Frumius Bandersnatch. And there was a guitar player named George Tickner who uh, was uh, also out of Frumius Bandersnatch in the original version of it. And they were, Mahavishnu was the model. They were going to be an all mm. instrumental band and they were going to do this fusion music. Uh, and the, did a show at Winterland where they opened on New Year's Eve and then they played a nightclub in town. And I saw that show. And it was strong. Uh, they, they had some, you know, pretty powerful, intense, the uh, kind of, uh, you know, fusion stuff that, that eventually wound up on their first album produced in San Francisco by Roy Halley, who's like this fast 
fastidious New York engineer that did all the Simon and Garfunkel records. It was not a really good matchup. And the first record went nowhere. Uh, and the second record, I think, was when they decided, well, we should sing a little. And, uh, uh, that may have been the third record. Anyway, they started loosening the concept up and, and, and the outtakes were sounding better than the stuff that was on the record. And then they made Greg Raleigh, who'd been Santana's vocalist, sing. And uh, that didn't really work out. They made, they made a cover of Beatles song, like, you know, how, how crassly commercial can you get? Well, let's get on the FM radio with it heavy metal version of a Beatles song. And then they found this kid, Robert Fleischman out of Denver, who was managed by the the, the big Bill Graham of Denver, um, Barry Fay. And, There's a kiss uh, connection there, you know. Yeah, but he, Fleisch, Fleischman was a pint-sized Robert Plant. And he was a little diva almost from the start. And 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 when Herbie heard the tape of that was somebody had given him of the Alien Project that had Steve Perry on vocals, Robert Fleischman could just start counting down. 10, nine. <laughs> <clears throat> they put Perry up on stage during a sound check and they hustled Fleischman out of the hall uh, with some subterfuge and just put him up there and had him sing a couple songs of sound check. And it was all over for Fleischman. <laughs> wow. And of course, you know, the next record was their first real sort of radio thing. And, and Perry started taking over the whole uh, artistic direction. And uh, they, they, they douched uh, uh, Greg Raleigh and, and brought in uh, John Kane. That From really, the babies. God, that guy. Anyway, uh, and, and yeah, now we're really just a polished pop product, right? I mean... I remember the album release party going over to Fantasy Studios and, and, and hearing Don't Stop Believing going, wow, huh. whoa, okay. Yeah, they were huge here, man. So it's they a completely huge. different band than what they started as. And, I, and that's what I wanted to get to. How did the San Francisco music climate accept that? Where all of a sudden it's like, now these guys are pretty much just going straight radio commercial. And then, you know, you've got the night night ranger being formed who's going straight commercial was there kind of a a revolt against some of these bands going you guys are just going for the money that's what you want you want well, by the, the money and success by the end of the 70s hippies were dead i mean they, they you know they were just pointless uh and and there was nothing that that point uh, that, that made that more apparent than the abundant scorn heaped upon the hippies by the punks. So, you know, the drugs had changed. Nobody was taking LSD and grooving in the park anymore. Everybody was snorting blow in the bathroom. <laughs> and uh, the, the, the whole culture had evolved around sit two or three or four times. I mean, take for instance, the, the San Francisco FM station, uh, KSAN, which was one of the founding underground rock stations. And it, the DJs were like superstars in their field. And so as the 70s creep along, you know, there's some of the guys are still playing the Moody Blues and Dave Mason and, you know, all that. But other guys are always used to being on the cutting edge and they're playing the brains and uh, the, the, the new wave stuff and the station started taking on the schizophrenic personality. Like, who are we? Are we these old guys that play Dave Mason? Or are we these new guys or money changes everything? And, you know, frankly, it mirrored a, a, a schism in the audience out there and, and they got mowed down by corporate enterprise that brought in uh, album oriented rock formatted playlists uh, researched uh, uh, demographics and just mowed down the old hippies at KSAN. And the next thing you know, it was a country station. So that's what was going on in the late 70s. And, and, and the culture was in confusion, but the record business wasn't confused. They wanted hits. And there was a lot of money being made. And it was still getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You have no idea what Fleetwood Mac did to the, 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 the corporate heads of Warner Brothers. Here they are battling 
to get their piece of the $80 million that the exorcist had out in concentric circles of revenue distribution, right? The theatrical, the distribution, da, 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 da. And they're trying to claw back that 80 million bucks. And then, and then the Fleetwood Mac starts selling 14 million copies and, and all the manufacturing costs and everything has been completely taken care of by the time they hit 3 million copies. And this money is just pouring on Warner Brothers and they don't even know what, do we have a record industry, a business? Oh, we have a record label, my God, look at this. It has earned three times what The Exorcist earned. Well, what do you think they did? They started acquiring small record labels. They started paying attention to it and they started applying corporate marketing methods and that started winnowing down all the experiments and the, the artistic guys and the AR guys says, hey man, that'd be cool, let's do that, you know? And it, by, the, by the mid eighties, MTV had taken over and the, there was no sense of anybody doing anything because it was artistically daring. It was all a form oh because I, it would I, sell I records. I so agree. I so agree. I tell you what, just go back now and, and look at how how Kiss and Aerosmith Smith fit right next to, you know, KC and the Sunshine Band and Gladys Knight. I, I mean, in the top 40. I mean, it was just a better it, the 70s to me were magic because it it really was it was all over the map um you know whereas in the 80s just you know again it was a lot more formulaic and and i i like the 70s just that whole natural sort of hey the song's good we're gonna play it you know that's the sort of aesthetic and and i i miss i miss that time and I, that's the music i identify with most i mean i i was born in 65 so I was just a kid through the seventies and, you know, I was a teenager and stuff in the 18 in, in the eighties, but I still, to this day, I give me the seventies catalog over anything else. I just thought the music was way better. It was a golden era. Uh, there, there's some thinking that it came to a close in, in 1977 uh, and uh, that um, the, the last waltz were, were the, were the final rites uh, of this classic rock movement. Uh, I, I, so I sort of understand that perspective. It seems somewhat art, but I will tell you that I think the last really great experimental American rock band that was lifted up by the record industry was the Talking Heads, and that was a long time ago. 70s. Yeah, yeah um, so Joe, Joe, ahead, Joe let's, let's circle back so we can wrap here and talk a little bit about your book, Hollywood Eden. It's, <laughs> it's a fascinating history trip back to rock and roll and how you discuss like one school one year gave birth to so much music that everything came after everything goes back to that point can you can you can you give us give our listeners well if, if they're still here and and <laughs> uh it, it's um in the context of what we're talking about, this is oldies but goodies. It is the birth of rock and roll. It is the origin story of the Beach Boys. Uh, and in fact, it is the origin story of West Coast pop. Uh, because in 1958, there was very little pop music being made in, in uh, Los Angeles or anywhere in California. It was uh, uh, outside of Frank Sinatra, Nat King Cole and Capitol Records. Mm -hmm. So it was all in New York or, or Chicago or even Memphis and New Orleans, but not Los Angeles. So, yeah, there's this one class at a university high school, the class of 1958. And they got into high school in September 1955, which was when James Dean died and when Rock Around the Clock by Bill Haley was on the charts. So they were the first rock and roll high school class. And, you know, they're so sophomore year was Elvis Presley and, and by their senior year, they were singing and playing rock and roll music themselves. And out of that senior class was Jan, his future partner, Dean, Nancy Sinatra, uh, Bruce Johnston, who later joined the Beach Boys, uh, Sandy Nelson, who's a drummer that would have big hit records, uh, Kim Fowley, a record producer. There was who's a- got, Who's got a Kiss connection. There, yeah. uh, there was a girl in that class, 
uh, named Kathy Conner, who's uh, known as Gidget at the beach. Her, fa her father wrote a book about her. Uh, yeah, the real Gidget was in this class. So these were um, uh, West Side Los Angeles kids, uh, upper uh, middle class, uh, Brentwood, Bel Air, a um, lot of show business people uh, with their kids in there, um, Nancy Sinatra. Uh, and uh, for these kids at this time and place in California, uh, it, it was kind of a paradise and an opportunity that just seemed un, unlimited. And they're the ones that started rock and roll in Los Angeles. And the book follows them from singing in the showers after football practice to Brian Wilson making good vibrations, which arguably is the greatest pop record ever made. So that that's in a nutshell, the story of Hollywood. It, it, it is an incredible musical history lesson. And, and, and I think, I mean, as, as music fans get older, I think more and more of us do start looking back to the roots of what we like, you know, what influ you know, you're a Kiss fan. Well, what influenced Kiss? Well, the Beatles were a huge influence on Kiss, but, you know, I think as a, as a fan, this is a great book to go back there and go, well, okay, what planted the seed that everything else grew out of, sprouted out of, you know, it's, you know, we've seen those family trees of rock and roll, you know, you go start, start at the top and you work your way all the way down and go, it all came right from here. Well, this is so much ancient history in many ways, but for me, it was an opportunity to uh, uh, paint a picture that I wanted to paint of a time and a place in Southern California that I have these strong romantic attachments to. I mean, this is Los Angeles before smog. This is Hollywood before freeways. This is these tiny little villages connected by these long, where kids had their own cars and their own telephones. Now, this is all crazy. Like, you know, uh, there's, there's a lot of people worrying about the draft in this book. In, and and I, I meet these uh, people in their 30s that read the book. They go, what was all the thing about the military? I'm like, yeah, that was, <laughs> <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> you know, I don't know about that now. But this was a very special and evanescent time and place that I, I find just, um, just terribly evocative to my imagination. And, and to, to get back there, with these people and walk through these streets and 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 witness these events, that 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 was what I wanted to do as a writer. I, I, it's a, it's two thumbs up for me, and I can, you know, with all all my heart, recommend go out, get the book, read it. If if you are a fan of rock history, Mark's a big fan. He loves all these rock history books. You got to get it because it just. It fills in all the pieces of what you hear and see and learned and read about and watched in this movie. And I don't know, I think it's fascinating when all those pieces connect and you can, you can see where everything came from. Well, I hope it makes a good story. Oh, definitely. Definitely. Joel, where can our listeners learn more about you, more about your book? <laughs> Um, where do they find you online? JoelSelvin.com uh, is a bunch of my uh, uh, podcasts. Uh, uh, Mark, you can, you can go uh, uh, check out my um, uh, uh, interview with Tom Waits. He uh, came over and we played records for an hour together. Oh, that's uh, cool. But there's a lot of other things on joelselvin.com. And of course, you know, if, you, if you're not anywhere near an independent local bookstore, Amazon will help you out finding my books. But, you know, independent local bookstores need your help, especially after this horrible year. Joel, let me ask you real quick as we go out here. Are you... Um, a voting member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? Oh, man, what a great question. Not only was I thrown off the nominating committee, I was thrown off the voting. For what? Well, the nominating committee uh, decided at some point that they wanted to move the focus into uh, uh, acts that started in the 80s. And they sent me a letter firing me because I was too old. Oh, uh, God. And uh, yeah, no kidding. And, and um, I showed it to my lawyer who, who routinely handles age discrimination beefs. And he said, did they pay you anything? I mean, did they cover your expenses? I go, not a dime. He goes, damn. 
<laughs> let, 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 let me just ask you then a final what if question. Then how I got thrown off the voting committee was uh, the year that Madonna won, uh, was elected. I just couldn't bring myself to vote. The ballot was just horrible. It was just packed with just ridiculous crap. And I wrote this long article on the Chronicle uh, about how I couldn't bring myself to vote. And by the way, I'd gotten kicked off the nominating committee. And by the way, Dave Clark Five should have been in last year, but they, they switched ballots and put Grandmaster Flash in because of diversity. And, you know, it just, just blew a big raspberry at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And, and, and that article lived for years on Google because I'd get these disc jockeys that, you know, when the nominations were announced, they Googled, you know, anti Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And this would just pop up and I'd be, going, oh, yeah, they're horrible. Uh, but uh, <laughs> Jan, uh, and, 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 and I tweaked Jan specifically in the article, I think, you know, and, and he just pulled me from the voting. Sweet. <laughs> Joel. Joel. Would you have voted for Kiss in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame if they had came up on a Probably ballot? Probably not, because my votes were always for people that, you know, other people weren't uh, uh, going to vote for. Uh, I always like, you know, like I, I voted eight years in a row for Gene Pitney. I, vo I voted several years for Dick Dale. Uh, uh, you know, there, there were just there's this, these people that they put on the ballot out of guilt and shame that they never, never, never thought would go, uh, would go in. I mean, Paul Butterfield Blues Band didn't appear on the ballot. They got sort of shoved in at the last minute. I voted for them several times, knowing they'd never get good, elected. Good, good for you. I mean, it, it's it's nice to, to. I used to vote in presidential elections that way too. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's nice to talk to somebody who um, feels the way a lot of just fans from the street feel about it. It's like, yeah, I don't know why that got voted in and why that got nominated. They should have gone after this. Was a real. This was the roots of rock and roll. That's it's, you know, here it's the rock and roll hall of fame, not the rap hall of fame. Oh, uh, so when I was on the nominating committee, uh, we all received a telegram uh, signed by a bunch of heavyweight uh, African-American artists. I remember Quincy Jones, uh, Diana Ross, Stevie Wonder, and, and there were others too. And, 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 and the telegram was, you guys need to put Miles Davis in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Now, you know, that is so ridiculous. But the most ridiculous part is what Miles would have thought of that. Amen. I mean, Miles would have just, he would have puked on it. I just, you know, what, how misplaced was. Oh, and by the way, next year, Miles was in. Wow. And, and by the way, as long as we're on the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, you know about Bruce Johnston from Reading Hollywood Eden, right? Right? And Bruce Johnston's this fantastic hero of Los Angeles rock and roll. But, you know, he's not a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame with the Beach Boys. I, gotta, I have no idea who that is. He, oh, well, Bruce Johnston, you need to read the book, Mark. You'll, you'll, <laughs> you'll find all out. He's been in the Beach Boys since 1965. And before that, he was had a very formidable career. And he's quite the, the contributor to our modern American music. But the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame only put Al, Carl, Brian, Dennis, and Mike in from the Beach Boys. Uh -huh. It's the same thing that they did to KISS. They only to put Kiss. the four <laughs> original members of KISS. They didn't put any of their other members who were there longer than some of those guys sold as many, if not more, albums. They only put the original four in. Yet anyone who even looked at, at uh, Bruce Springsteen got in. Oh, you. Oh, you that Bruce Springsteen induction, that was an embarrassment of major proportions. Amen. You know, uh, I, I, I understand from somebody who was at the event that it took an hour and a half for all those thank you speeches. I, I mean, it, uh, it, it, that, that was just an embarrassment. Embarrassment, but you know, hey, you know who runs the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame? John Landau and Jan Wenner. Exactly. There you yeah. go. There you go. All right, man. All right, Joel. Thank you so much. It's always fascinating hearing your your musical journey. I mean, you need to go do a speaking tour and share these stories. So that was on the tour. books before the pandemic. I had I had a a, a, a series of dates that we were going to do with Huey Lewis because Huey can't sing anymore. Right. So he wanted to go on stage and tell stories, but he needed somebody as a foil, you know, so, you know, 
he and I, we, we tell stories pretty good together. Uh, I, I would so there, we, I would, we, had, we had some dates booked and, you know, I'll, I'll be there in a I was, second. I was going to make a lot of money. <laughs> well, Huey's going to split the money with me. I go, oh, no, man, you, Huey, they're not coming to see me. He goes, I don't need the money. Hopefully, hopefully you'll get back <laughs> out there when things open. Uh, you know, years ago, I went and saw from Clover, Alex Call did a little sure. speaking show up in Fairfax. It's at Fairfax or something like that. Yeah. He shared his stories of writing songs and playing with people and played some music. It was an absolutely fascinating event to hear the stories of what went on behind it. And you're Alex has some it. charm too, you know, he it's is not like great guy. To a doofus. Yeah. Yeah. Great guy. Joel, thank you so much. This thank was quite you, the honor. And Lisa. And, and Le yes, Lisa, meet Joel, Joel, meet Lisa. <laughs> I was just listening. I was completely fascinated by your stories. I was, I was totally intrigued. Was, well, I'm, I'm glad to see you and, and, and uh, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for joining us, I should say. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys. Right, take take care, care Joel. Take care. That's, that's the kind of guest. I know Mark loves that kind of guest. Yeah, I think? love that kind of guest. I was I care. totally intrigued. Lisa, you, you, you got in after I, he shared some of his kiss stories, which granted they were not like, like minutia, like sharing dirt type of stories, but it was fascinating to get the take of a music critic back then when kiss was just coming out of how he saw them and how it was perceived you know and all of his stories about the bands at the winterland dude i, I swear to god i, I do have a little minutia tour. i do have a little minutia to add to that story the reason i knew the tubes were opening is that bill graham gave kiss just shit because the tubes were his baby yep and the fact that they they had to you know um uh shit Share the stage with these fucking East Coast, you know, brutes. He didn't like it. You know, he, he thought the bill should have been the other way around. And you know what I mean? That it's kind of a famous sort of. And, and, and you can you know, imagine, can you imagine the phone call or the face to face conversation Bill Graham had with Bill O'Coin to just like duke that out of Bill O'Coin saying, no way in hell is Kiss opening for the tubes i don't care if it is your venue i don't care if they are your band um yeah you know that's the time machine i'd love to get in and go back to just be that fly in the wall and witness that stuff as i said go go check out joel's book he's written like 20 other books by the way he, he wrote a book called the peppermint twist and i have to go get this book it's about the mob the music and the most famous dance club of the 1960s that just sounds absolutely amazing. Just throwing that out there. Sorry to yeah. say. So, that's just one of his books. I mean, that's just. Go 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 to joelsullivan.com. You'll find info on his new book, but all of his other books. As he said, he wrote he wrote with Sammy Hagar. He wrote Sammy Hagar's book with him. Which but, I did read, which is fantastic. So, I mean, you know, and, and as we know, this guy's a rock fan. He may not be a big <laughs> fan of Kiss. He's a rock fan. I bet he's a great storyteller. Oh, God. I mean, amazing. I was, I could, I was like. Amazing. I, 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 I would go to a two hour storytelling event Me in too. a heartbeat if he Me did. Me too. That. I was just, I could listen to him talk for hours. Just the, just the way he spoke about it. It was just so animated and just, it was, I, I, I loved yeah. it. So, so homework for this week, um, you know, have you read any of Joel's books? Cause like I said, he's got like 20 of them. Um, you know, what did you think about his stories and description of Kiss at Winterland and what was going on? And, you know, put the Kiss Army, we fight for our band to the side and just listen to it through, you know, mature, rational years and hear what he was saying. What, what was your takeaway from that? Because I found that fascinating, again, of hearing from a music critic. And, and Joel's a quite respected music critic. So... Lisa, you're muted. Sorry. I said, no, he's just not any just music critic. I mean, he has yes. history and established and well-respected. And, and, and listen, I, I I had no idea where we were going to go with the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame there at the end, but boy, I was glad I brought that one up. Amen. That was that, that guy. Was, he understands it. That was awesome to hear that because you know how much I can't stand the Hall of Fame. And oh, yeah. I, I, I had no idea any of that had happened with him. So I was just wanting to play the what if. If you were a voting member, would you have voted for, for Kiss? Did you, know, did you know he got kicked off? No. Nope. That was hysterical. 
I, I, I love it. I absolutely love it. I, you know, I, I, I kind of feel like he, Joel might not be a, a, a Kiss fan, but he's part of the army. He, mm-hmm. He's got that fight attitude of, I'm, you know, fist up in the air. Come for me. I don't care. Well, early on, I was trying to see if he even liked that kind of music, like heavy, hard rock, you know, because I, I, one of the things that and, and I, I've said it a million times. The first review that Kiss got in Rolling Stone was a glowing review, um, the, the debut record. They said right. it was a really good record. Um, you know, same thing with Circus. They said it was a good record. It Kiss, as they quickly started to catch on, then it was just cool to hate on them because... Right. You know, and this whole, this, I always laugh at the whole thing with, oh, they got all this money behind. Really? They got fucking Bill of Coins credit card and it's maxed out. That's what they got fucking behind them. They weren't, they weren't living. Yeah, you know, I always hate, oh, they had, fuck no. They, they fucking made it up as they went along. <laughs> well, I mean? let, let, let's be honest. I mean, you know, Casablanca was spending money, but spending money to the point where it nearly put the label out of business because they weren't making money. Yes, that I, that's my whole point. It wasn't like, you know, there was they were too big to fail or anything like that. You know what I mean? They were living in the lack of lap of luxury. Fuck, far from it. They were busting their ass, paying their dues. Yep, yep, yep. So, and that's the truth. Talk, you know, homework is just you know what what was your take on this? What's your take on Joel? You know, talk about anything related to that. Um, go out get his book definitely you know if, if you really want a great history lesson into the birth especially the california pop music scene um this and and it's going to be bands it's like the beach boys who hasn't heard of the beach boys you're going to know of this stuff um and uh if you are watching us on youtube hit the subscribe button follow us on spotify uh, subscribe on iTunes. We're on Twitch as well. And in bedrock, uh, bedrock. And next week we're having a fun episode next week. We're doing a three sides of the coin kiss trivia, meaning, and, and you guys might not even be aware of this yet. I've got a couple guests coming in here who are putting together a kiss trivia for us, and they're going to try and stump us. And it's some good stuff. I don't know. It probably won't stump Mark. Yeah. Well, I'm gonna. I'm just gonna tell you right now. Next Tuesday, I will be sun in my buns um, down in FLA, and next Tuesday is my 30th wedding anniversary. So there's a damn good oh, chance. Right. Remember, we always used to. There's, go a, there, to... there's a damn good chance you'll still be on the show telling us <laughs> sorry. Remember, we used to go to the Kiss Expos, and it was always during your anniversary. Remember? Yeah. 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 So just kind of crazy, but yeah, 30 years, man, wow. 30 years of Liz putting up with this crazy stuff. So speaking of uh, the lovely and talented, she has dinner upstairs. So, so let, let's wrap this up people. We'll see everybody next week. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks.